Hello, everybody. Again, it's me, Dean, here. I'm here with Martin Dangerfield. Uh, he runs a very interesting uh, recruitment business. He may not describe it that way, but I'm going to let him introduce himself. So, Martin, thanks for doing this. I should just say, just to give you some defense, this is totally unscripted. <laughs> so I'm going to ask stuff, and I might put Martin on the spot. So I'm going to apologise in advance. Yeah, so okay. Martin, I've done worse, I'm sure. So I'm sure it'll be okay. Um, so I'm Martin Dangerfield. I run Dangerfield. We provide. Um, we always talk about being embedded recruitment and more. And what that really means is putting recruiters on site, um, replacing recruitment agencies, and being that transition for organisations who are going to go and hire for themselves. Um, it's quite a daunting prospect sometimes to go and. You know, go and actually go out into the big bad world and talk about your company and do all the all the bits and pieces with recruitment that people often forget. Um, we also run projects for sort of enterprise companies and also talk quite a lot about employer branding, about you know having an authentic, meaningful brand when you go out and talk to candidates about you know why should they come and work here. Before we get into the whole COVID thing, yeah, just just talk to me about the kinds of businesses where they're transitioning from rec- using a recruitment company. Yeah. to going in-house, yeah. uh, what are they experiencing when they're in that phase where the uh, recruitment isn't enough, uh, but maybe resource or or demand doesn't necessitate yeah, it, having a department? So our, t- our target customer, it's probably the thing to talk about, is a stereotypical you know, 200 or so people business, um, quite often in tech, but not exclusively. Um, and there's a transition point. So they've grown from that first bit. When they were a proper startup, you know, somebody has an idea and they've got together and they've hung around it wherever they hang around and come up with the idea and off they go. And they bring friends with them. That's typically your first the first few hires are your friends that you knew. And that guy that you once worked with, who was all right. And you still got him in your phone or that bloke you play football with. And they all come together eventually. And and But that runs out of pub because actually as you get bigger, um, the job takes over and you become becomes more important. So what you then find is, People then do this sort of awkward halfway house of recruitment where they didn't do it very well. And most people's immediate reaction is, I know I will go to a recruitment agency. And that's fine. So they go off to a recruitment agency and their experience of that recruitment agency can be is good, bad and different. I'm not here to, to belittle recruitment companies. Some are brilliant. Some are bloody awful. We tend to hear about the awful ones rather than the great ones. But, you know, that's, that's the thing. Um, the challenge that that company then faces as it grows is it loses control of, of the process. So it's effectively given the recruitment company free reign to go out into the market, find people uh, and charge a, you know, a reasonably hefty fee for that activity. So what we do is to find companies who are on that transition. So sometimes they'll be saying, actually, I'm going to go and get my own recruiter. I don't want to mm-hmm. use recruitment agencies. But that first recruiter struggles because they're often the only person in the business who does that. Um, and of course, everybody is an expert in recruitment because we've all done it um, and they get saturated. You know, there's a there's a there's an understanding of what is it we do here. Um, think about tech company. Often it's not the tech bit that's the difficult bit. It's the you know, the accountant, the receptionist, the, the salespeople. They're more difficult to find. Mm-hmm. And so what we do is put a team on site at that point and say, we'll do everything. So we'll put recruiters who know how to recruit for you. We'll put a platform in place to help you manage that, which is, you know, uh, is transparent. You can see what's going on, see what we're up to. Um, but more and more, we also have a conversation about brand and process. And it's those little things, you know, you, when we've ever been for a job, it's nice that we know what's going on and when the next steps are. We, we, we bring that. And that's something that's often missing from a recruitment consultant. Mm. Um, the other big thing we bring to organisations, though, is we you know, they own the candidate. So if we talk to somebody, well, we're only talking to them about you, you know, if I'm mm-hmm. going to come and try people, you know, get people for you, I'm talking about you. Whereas a recruitment consultant is very much thinking, oh, you're a good candidate. I could I could put you in three or four places. Let me start those three or four conversations going. Because mm-hmm. um, we really want to just, you know, be, be the brand. But we, we, we take away the problem and the headache of recruitment for organisations for, for, for a chunk of time. You're not incentivized by getting somebody hired. And I don't mean that in the negative sense. I mean... Often there's a drive to get fees, and sometimes yeah. you can push people in front of clients. Yeah, abs- uh, yeah abs- just- you know, I've worked, you know, I've worked in an agency. So yes, you're right. You're, you're driven by a fee rather than the right person for that job. So yes, we we do a subscription model, um, and that's actually part of a challenge sometimes with people stepping into it because with a 
with a recruitment consultant, um, typically it's success only. So if they do hire the person, then they pay the fee. Yeah. With us, there's a slight with us as a slight leap of faith, which says we're going to charge you for a month or two months or three months or on an annual basis, whether we hire or not. Mm-hmm. So we have to be quite confident that we're going to go and hire some people. So yes, you're right. We will definitely take. We'll probably take longer initially as well. I will say that it's a bit of a bit of an unselling of everything. It's amazing, but look, actually, some of the the early stages are difficult because we we want to find out the process and actually deliver an experience that the candidates love. It works with the hiring manager. We we'll certainly pick up more of that cultural stuff around what's it like to work here and what's you know what what works and what doesn't. Um, and that awkwardly means you spend a bit more time at the, the, the sort of the early stages. Then a recruitment consultant wouldn't do that. They just leap straight in and start throwing your CVs. It's funny you should say that because one of the biggest things I um, struggle with here, and there's only about twenty or so of us here, yeah. um, is you've got a dynamic in your yeah. business, and just like. Just like you said there, a lot of the people who work with me, I've known. Mm-hmm. And what you're trying to do is not just find somebody who's really good at what they do, but somebody who can fit into yeah. um, an environment where they don't end up kind of, how can I put it? Not not disrupting the culture and the vibe, but at the same time, feeling at home in it. Yeah, you want people to come along and, and yeah, join you, don't you? You want them to join your organization, do the thing they said they're going to do, but then add and contribute and help you grow. So, yeah, as a 20 people business, yeah, employee number 21 is still a, a really important hire in that respect. And you, as you say, you want the want the good disruptive element, don't you? Hey, I've got this great idea, wrote really well. And everybody goes, yeah. Yeah, so that cultural hiring is obviously, that's that's the second bit of it. And I think because we're on site with people, I think we're, we're able to to well you're getting much, the culture as well aren't yeah you? we're much better we're doing a much better job of it because because mm-hmm. we're there i mean to, to be honest you if we're using use an example as a 20 something business you'd we'd struggle with you a little bit because you're not hiring every day yeah. so there is a sort of volume point as well so it's yeah. how many people you're hiring but undoubtedly yeah spending time with you and understanding your organization is is absolutely part of it we, we become part of you um, because that's important because then you do get that, those, those little subtleties about they, they, they all love cats and they all love dogs, you know? So don't bring a cat person into a dog room. It's that sort of, it's that sort of yeah. nuanced thing. Um, you know, I'm looking at your, your shelf on, on there. You love Star Wars, I'm guessing, because I can see a giant Star oh, Wars thing, you know? Oh, you missed it there. Have I? It's Star <laughs> Trek. Oh, I can see Star Wars on the shelf. Oh, <laughs> bottom oh, shelf. That- that's a gift from somebody who couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> Damn. See, so I failed on the first hurdle that I can't recruit for you ever again. But you know what I mean? It says I look around an office and go, ah, they like they like this. And you get that theme. I've, I've just done some work. Somebody have got, um, oh, we've got the Star Wars theme. They've got um, a full-size R2-D2 in their office um, because that tech team love Star Wars. So it's, it's not that you go out looking for a person, for a person who only loves Star Wars. But you get a feel, don't you, of actually yeah. this is their thing and this is what they do, you know. So we yeah. were very part of it. That was a good recovery. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to get to COVID, you know, mm. the, the elephant in the room. How have you dealt with it? Well, let's deal with that. How have you, how's, it, how's it worked for you uh, and what, what have you seen? And okay. what's, what's the changes you're going to think are going to stick versus what's temporary? So what I've seen, so as a business um, – yeah, so you've got me in a good mood today. I'm in my optimistic mood. Um, in my slow, slow declining, uh, depressed moments, I suspect it wasn't quite so optimistic. So yeah, as a business, yeah, we've almost we've almost closed in that respect. We've got you know live live hiring clients where we've got people on site. We don't have people on site anymore because because they're not hiring. Those doors are closed quite obviously. I was on site with a client which also finished sort of end of March. Piece of work with there, so we've got this sort of void so from yeah from a business we're 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 being entirely optimistic of hey let's go out there i think there's been a sort of perception certainly in recruitment that you have to avoid selling too soon that the idea that it's all going to be great and let's sell I mean, and certainly again it sounds like I'm, I'm having a go at the recruitment agency some some recruitment agencies have really missed the trick there they've just gone straight out with here we've got candidates do you want them and they sort of hit the phones because that that's what they thought people well that's what they wanted for them but of course everybody sort of closed their doors a little bit so most of the companies that we work with are tech based. So, you know, those organizations are doing okay. They've gone home, they're working from home, mixed, mixed results about how successful that is. 
But I think that legacy of that working from home thing, something in one client of ours, which was very office based. You know, if you're not in the office, you can't be doing anything. They will definitely not go back to having the same work environment that they had. They will definitely be online an awful lot more. And from a from a recruitment perspective, that's going to be a challenge because because of that cultural piece you talked about. Mm-hmm. Culture is going to be different if we're all genuine, genuinely remote. And I think some organisations, not all, will have genuine remoteness. All we're substituting is this Skype call with with you. That looks like your office. That's now my culture. With well, I've changed employers. My I'm not on Skype. I'm on Zoom now. I'm not on Zoom. I'm on Google Hangouts. So how you how you make that culture real is really really challenging. I think I think for that transition, there are some companies that have done. I've never had an office. Um, are successfully remote all of the time. But I often wonder if that's because that's how they've always been and that's how they started. They've just got into this thing a little bit easier. They've found ways of working that, that, that capture that stuff. So somebody said to me, and I don't know whether you agree or disagree with this, is that effectively what this feels like or they felt like they now worked as a freelancer Mm. They said it felt like they've gone freelance because they now work at home, dial into meetings, do their piece, check out. Yeah, there's a couple of people who said, <laughs> yeah, the people I know, there's people with real jobs rather than working for themselves. Um, yeah, they do. That, that, that association, there's, there's two things that have happened. So in some cases, some people definitely feel closer to their their organisation. So whilst it's been sort of doomy and gloomy, how do you do culture? Some have found out more about certainly their managers and their stuff. You know, I I can see your bookshelf. I can see other stuff going on so i don't know how many zoom calls you're now being with people in kitchens and various bits of bedroom and very whatever and that they found something out about them i, I was on a very grown-up interview funnily enough um at night not that long ago and we were chatting to the candidate there was two of us on a call doing an interview and talking to the candidate um and the person my, my colleague you know her, her son walked in it's like oh, i need i need a drink it's like because it was you know, it's at ten o'clock at night. It's like, well, all right, it's a minute. Can we just hold this? Guy? And it's that informality actually made it actually made it more comfortable rather than less comfortable. What could have been quite awkward in a very sort of yeah. You know, whereas maybe six months ago that would be seen very unprofessional and you I would have been be embarrassed. Oh, absolutely, but oh my god, what are you doing? How dare you? I'm I'm off. I can't believe I'm working with this sort of company. But that that became more real. That a human contact. But the other end of it, people are struggling. I mean, it's and it's not the people I thought would struggle um i'm of a certain age it was my my birthday last week and obviously i'm not 29 like i think i am um but if i were 29 they they i thought would cope with this but actually if you're living in a house share and there's four of you working from home now oh god that's hell isn't it there's four of you sat on a zoom call or a skype call or whatever there's no privacy you're in each other's this each other's lives an awful lot more that's that's you can see people have started to have real challenges yep. with that. And I think that rubs off into the workplace as well. There are people who are desperate to get back to an office because it will give them a sense of disconnect between this is my office and that is my home. Yeah. Um, but I think you're right, the freelance a bit. And certainly some people's days have extended. What do you, you know, where where are you tonight? Well, I'm at home. Of course you are. We'll, we'll just do a call now instead. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that extension of the day, you've lost the commute. Yeah. Certainly it, it feels okay to shove a call in at eight o'clock and eight o'clock, you know, both ends of the day and it's 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 all right. Um so I think some employers are taking advantage of that. So I'm gonna ask you to be Mystic Meg now. <laughs> okay. I get nobody knows how this is playing out. You know, I, I don't even think the government knows how this is gonna play yeah. out. What do you how do you see the next six months in terms of jobs in the economy? And where you're going how i've accepted pretty much that a lot of 2020 is a write-off in terms of our business plan we've actually effectively wrote a new business plan what does that look like for you the next six months and what do you think the jobs market looks like uh again if i'm optimistic it's gonna be fine we're all gonna go back down the pub on the 15th of june it's gonna be marvelous you know distance to however long the legal requirement is if it's going to be two meters or a meter Sounds a bit bonkers either way. Um, So what I've seen recently, so the companies I know, um, again, back to the, the, let's talk about the really, the healthy ones, the ones that were successful before coronavirus and remain successful now. Chances are they're just going to weather the storm. They've got money in the bank. They won't do any more recruitment. They won't take on more new people, but they'll do with what they've got. And actually that's, that's probably okay. You know, and I think there are worse things in life than going, 
well, I can't leave this place for a while and we're not getting any new people, but it's going to be all right. And um, the furloughing of large numbers of people will be interesting. So I've had, you know, my, my world is all about recruitment and hiring and the, and the good stuff. But in the last three weeks, I've had several approaches for, can you help us get rid of our people? Can we manage that as a process? Mm. Um, the answer is yes, not, not stuff I love to do, but there's more of that. And I'm only one person in one little microcosm. If I'm being asked, do you know someone or can you help? That means a lot of companies are thinking about, they furloughed their staff. When the furlough money runs out from the government, what next? And I think it's such a difficult call, isn't it? It will depend how, it's all about confidence. Um, I'm lucky that I do some work outside of the UK. So we've got um, Danish customers and we've doing some work with a German customer. Uh, and um, Denmark's pretty much back to normal, aren't they? Well, they are and they aren't. So from a, from, from a, from in terms of, you know, um, COVID, they, they've, schools have gone back. There was no second peak. Um, their death rate was really low, but they closed before we did. And they're a much, much, much smaller country. You know, there's a five, mm-hmm. it's a five six million population. It's not a, not a big country. But because they closed early, they also feel that they've, they've weathered the storm. It's interesting. You compare Denmark with Sweden, you know, Sweden haven't closed anything and have got, climb up to 5,000 deaths, uh, a bigger a bigger population, but clearly Denmark are, are, are sorted. So they're confident that, that life's going to go back to something near normal. Um, their biggest reliance, though, is on Germany to sort itself out, make sure Germany is as healthy. You know, their market is Germany. Mm. Um, and so Germany's obviously a lot bigger. It's in a different place. It's, it's a much better place than we are um, from a coronavirus infection rate and death rate and everything else rate, much, much better. So I think... I think the UK, I think um, I think we've not actually, if I'm pessimistic, we've not seen the worst of it yet. We've seen a sort of slight wave of people going home, a bunch of people being furloughed and it all being, it's going to be all right. It depends what organisations do with that furlough staff, whether they get rid of their staff. There'll be some winners and some losers, I think. You know, mm. Retail, are we really going to rush back to the shops when they open? I'm not, I'm not convinced we are. Well, but it's are interesting we going to go online? Say, then we may do. You know? It's interesting you say that because, you know, all the shops, non-essential retail can open from Monday, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. At what point have we been told we can go to the shops? <laughs> we haven't. I, I got my first email, though. I travel on trains a lot, so I go with um, – so I've been going to Nottingham recently, so it's East Midlands, and they've sent me an email today saying, from Monday, you can come on our train, but you must wear a mask. That's the mm-hmm. first one, that sort of official, yeah. official line of – Actually, we acknowledge you can come and do this, but you're, you've got to be masked. And I think that's that will be an interesting thing. That next transition, I think there's a belief that we, yeah, we were trying to get back to something normal, whatever normal is. But definitely, there are organisations who are saying we don't need to have that old normal. We want a new normal, and it's a remote working business. It's a little bit leaner. It means that they have to engage with their employees in a different way. Probably means you're going to have to hire differently as well. From my perspective, that's yeah, for my my business, I'm optimistic that people are going to say, how do we hire online? We don't really know how to do that. Or how do we, how do we capture that essence of culture? And I think that's the, that's actually the most difficult bit. How do we make all those individual Skype calls look like a business and feel like a place that I want to work at rather than just my gig between yeah, the because, and the next because gig? Because that organism that you create, and make sure I say that right, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, that organism that you create has a feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I know we're touching on employer brand and stuff like that here, but um, when you create something, people pick up a, a vibe. Yeah, you've got, you've got, uh, yeah, you use the word culture, you use the word whatever, but yeah, you get you get a feel for what that that place looks like. I, I worked for a large um, a large US software company for for a few years. That was the closest to this because I had remote. I had several teams in in scattered across Europe, so we were never in the same place anyway. So an awful lot of our time was sat on video calls anyway. And um, what I found was the team that I was with most of the time, which was in the UK, got the best version of me. They got the informal version, the sarcastic version, which obviously I loved. Um, they got the bit that said, do you fancy a coffee? Should we go and grab a coffee? That, all that all sort of informality. Whereas the team in Dublin, which isn't that far away, they got probably the second best version of me. I used to see them on a reasonably regular basis. But, yeah, if you were in France or Germany, we'd have a very structured, casual moment. Hey, let's catch up for a virtual coffee. I've scheduled your, your diary's empty at this time. I've scheduled at this time. And it loses some of that connection. 
And I think that's probably the challenge that organizations face, isn't it? How do you create a connection and be a thing if we never get together? And I say, I assume there's a sort of assumption that we never get together. I also think there's that sort of hybrid moment that the organizations that were all in the office will not be doing all in the office, but undoubtedly will have days where they come and do things and particularly those more sort of creative, um, either creative teams or creative industries, they're going to miss out. You know, again, you miss out on that. I've had an idea. Yeah. And right? bouncing yeah. off other people's ideas. Absolutely. And I can still see the, the danger is you almost finish up like, you know, Thursday's idea day. We're all going to this table. We're going to sit around here and have ideas. Whereas it doesn't work like that, does it? it, it there are moments of you sat in, a, sat in a bath going, I've had an idea or wherever it is, the commute to work, the thing to whatever, all those little nuances contribute to that. So mm. I just think we'll just find a different way. But I, for some organisations that are going to be way up, I think we're going to have a, a bit of a bit of a crappy summer. You know, some people will be jetting off to wherever and going to going abroad and then I don't know, coming back and hopefully 14, coming back. For, yeah, and coming back in 14 days of quarantine. I don't know. The um but for for, for the vast majority, I think there's going to be some organizations that just go, we're, we're not furloughing, we're, we're making redundant now and we're going to get rid of it. Because if in some cases survived without those people and realized I can do without. I mean, there's there's some companies I've I've worked with in the past who were hiring lots and lots and lots of people. Never could quite work out what they all did, but they're all being very, very, very busy. If you strip back a little bit, you furloughed some of them, you realise actually that that person, Christ, we really miss them. We definitely want them back. So in some cases, like wow, you're 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 of great value. I quite suspect they've unfurloughed them already. Um, but the others, like, well, we didn't really miss you when you were gone, and you know, yeah, bye. So, um, so you see, obviously, uh, remote working to some degree is here to stay. Yeah. Or hybrids of. Yeah. Which means. We need to get better at recruiting digitally. Yeah, we need to get better at yeah recruiting digitally because it is it, there is some new, there are some nuances around hiring. You know, you lose that personal contact. I always think actually, I think sometimes um, video interviewing though is easier. Certainly, if you're a candidate, it's easier. You know, I've got a notebook in front of me. I could say anything here. I've just got that. You know that 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 thing that we go into a meeting sometimes. Right, I must tell them I'm great at this. I must tell them I'm great at this. And you go into the interview and it's gone. Whereas, you know, if I've got a piece of paper, I can write down my, my top three things I want to leave. Yeah. leave you know, post, post, post it's all around. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Don't, you know, don't say the word whatever. Make sure you love, you know, say how much you love their television or whatever it is. So I think there's some other things that are useful. I think candidates would be interested in that. They, they can actually deliver more. Mm-hmm. I think employers have got to be careful that they take a little bit more time to be probably a bit more in depth. Again, you know, we, we read so much in body language and so much in how we how we interact with people. Um, I I did some work for a company where I always used to go, I was hiring loads of salespeople. So I interviewed everybody. I interviewed hundreds of salespeople. And I would always go and talk to the receptionist. I'd go down to reception, grab the salesperson, and just say, well, just go and grab the lift. And I'd go straight to the receptionist and ask, what were they like when they checked in? How were they with you? Because you get that instant feel of, What's this person like when they walk in anywhere? Because they're going to represent our company. Are they going to be the next one? And you miss all of those things. Yeah. In some cases, it won't matter because, to be blunt, you know, if I'm hiring a salesperson now, they're also probably going to spend their whole life life in front of a, a, a Zoom call. Um, so, so let me ask you this, hmm. uh, and this is totally. Well, I wasn't going to ask this, but um, <laughs> ask anything. There we you go. we we have a a small group of people who are focused on business development. Yeah, so sales salespeople, but yeah. generally office based interacting people. Yeah. I've always struggled to read who is a good salesperson and who isn't. Mm. Given You're that not. you given that you it might be just yeah. my poor judge, judgment, you know. How do you tell? Because I know a lot of people will go, oh, we need to dr- drive our sales and they'll be looking at hiring salespeople. How do you tell? Who are bluntly the bullshitters from the people who actually do the good job and and deliver for? I wish I could say it was a magic source. I mean, you, you clearly there is the, there is some evidence. What actually, what tends to happen actually is people in an interview they ask a salesperson the question and they get the answer they're expecting to hear. Um, and actually, nine times out of ten, you're just worth worth asking the next step. Um, and it's to do with yeah, qualify qualify a salesperson like they would you'd want them to qualify. An opportunity and you're just asking them give me some real evidence give me hard facts 
And it's, it's, it's amazing how quickly salespeople staff at quite a high level of I'm amazing, I, I hit target. Oh, brilliant. And what was the target? Was it, was it a revenue target? Was it a number of calls? Was it a customer target? Tell me more about that. And you and you genuinely, you're, you're asking questions based around evidence and you're looking for evidence all the time. It says, ticked in sales, tell me about that scenario. So there's, there's two schools of thought. You can either ask lots of lovely sort of general questions or actually really dig into, tell me about a real situation. Now, normally salespeople will give you their best ever activity and that's fine. But it's got to be you, you. You'll you'll spot the bullshit. Yeah, the answer is maybe it's just I'm used to hearing bullshit. I don't know. I just uh, <laughs> I, I'm the worst. I used to be. I used to be an IT. I mean, one of the advantages I used to be an IT sales years ago. I used to be an IT sales. So I had a very, I guess, a, a, a view on what what being a salesperson is, um, and that has translated into interviewing salespeople. But undoubtedly, just just. Just ask several more questions around the same one. We tend to take we take the first answer as, oh, okay. So, you, you know, I'm amazing at salesperson. Oh, yeah. great, good. You sold so, a million. Yeah, I sold a million. Did you? Was it you? Was it your team? Uh, was it? Did you lead this or did you that? What does that, yeah, or what does that actually look like? And get into the real, quite early on, the nuts and bolts of what does your target look like? Because, yeah, most nine, nine and a half out of ten salespeople are driven by a revenue target of some sort. Mm. Break it down. What does that look like? Because it, it also comes undone quite quickly. People say big numbers. And you go, so what's the, you know, if, you, if you're, it was a million in orders, for some example, what does that break down into? What's an average sale look like? Oh, it's half a million. That means you sell two, you've done yourself two, two things this year. Mm. Uh, no, 10. Oh, so it's 50, 000. and it's just that it yeah. unravels really quickly. I know a lot of businesses that struggle hiring salespeople. Then because I'd love, meet, I'd love to meet your businesses that struggle hiring sales, but there's, there's a genuine, there's a little, there's a gap. Most, uh, a lot of what I do, this sort of on-site stuff, they focus in on the technology and tech, tech hiring. It's the sales and account execs and customer success type people far more difficult to hire. That's mm. actually a real value for them. So, okay. Good. So Martin, this has been fascinating. How do you want people to reach out to you if they go, do you know what? I like this guy. I think he can help us. What's the best way to get in touch the with you? The best bet is often just LinkedIn. We spend our whole life on LinkedIn. The good news about Martin Dangerfield, there is any, there's only three of us on LinkedIn, and you'll know which one it is because yeah, one looks like this. One's a professor of Balkan studies, and one works for Thames Water. So there you go. Okay. So, Martin, this has been really interesting. I'll put your details, website, and everything here somewhere. Thank you for giving up your time for this. I hope you've kind of uh, not had too much of a spontaneous grilling. No, it's pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. No, I've had worse. And uh, thank you everybody for watching and check out for the next interview. If you've liked this video, please do subscribe. Uh, thanks for watching the channel. There's some other videos you can watch uh, all about helping you grow your business, help you think a bit differently so that you can grow your business successfully. Uh, thanks for watching.